everybody. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Guild um, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Paul had said, um, a couple, geez, I guess it was over the summer, I had the opportunity of playing for um, the board. And um, I didn't have a ton of time to, to speak, so this is really nice to be invited to, to share a little bit more about um, an organization that has had a really profound effect on my career, um, which is the Sphinx Organization. Um, for those of you that are um, not familiar, the Sphinx Organization um, actually was first founded in 1996, and um, the mission of this organization began um, as you know, as a way to identify and develop the talent of young um, Latinx and African American musicians. The flagship program of the Sphinx organization is the Sphinx Competition, which began in 1997. And um, it is open to anybody who is a string player and of Latinx or African American descent. Um, this is a Detroit based nonprofit organization, actually, and um, in the 20 plus years since its inception, they have really been the leader in addressing the lack of diversity and inclusion within the classical music world. Um, they have been working with, um, to, working to help the artistic development of young Latinx and black musicians and composers through the competition and through um, many more programs, uh, which they now have come to fruition. Before I kind of get into the details more about um, the various programs that Sphinx does, I wanted to talk a little bit about my own background um, and how I eventually became involved with Sphinx. As Paul said, I'm from uh, Buffalo, New York, originally, born and raised. And um, from a very young age, I was always surrounded by music. My father is a professional musician. He's a professional horn player. Uh, I played in the Buffalo Philharmonic, so I grew up hearing a lot of horn music, a lot of classical music. Um, and my mother is a Venezuelan woman, um, and she came to the United States with my father. They had met um, in Caracas, Venezuela. He performed in one of the symphonies there. They decided to leave the country and come back to the US when they had my older sister. Um, so, growing up, I heard all sorts of, like I said, classical music, but I also heard salsa music all the time. And, you know, the great salsa kings and queens, Celia Cruz and Gloria Stefan, and, but at the same time, I was also hearing Strauss excerpts from the other room from my dad. So it was probably kind of a unique, um, you know, upbringing musically, at least in that, in that sense. Um, for me, Growing up uh, with, you know, in a biracial, with biracial parents, um, it was never really very difficult for me embracing kind of both sides of, you know, um, myself. We often, at my house, you'll hear languages in both Spanish and English and conversations that <laughs> kind of intermix the two, and I'm definitely fluent in Spanglish. Um, <laughs> yeah. My Spanish is okay, but <laughs> it needs some work. Um, but um, I really remember as I, you know, started to get older um, that I was the only Latinx person in my orchestra, even in my high school, with the exception of my sister. Um, so, you know, I kind of remember feeling a certain way about showing up as my complete self to the orchestra. And um, I think it was very easy for people to kind of, um, for me, to blend in because um, nobody really knew that I was actually Latinx until I started using my hyphenated name. And then people were like, oh, I didn't know that about you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it wasn't really until I came to Cleveland in 2005 um, that I got to meet other musicians who were like me. And even then, there was really just a handful of us. Um, it was actually my teacher, Stephen Gaber, my cello teacher, who was the first person to tell me about Sphinx. He had said, there's this competition, it's for Latinx and African American people, you should audition. And I thought to myself, like, this is kind of a really unique thing. I've never heard of anything like this. And um, I believe I was in my junior year. I had just 
um, got in a position, my first orchestral position, with the Canton Symphony at that point. And so I was like, this is something that I really want to do. So I prepared an audition tape, and I worked really hard with my teacher and sent in the CD. And a month or so later, I found out that I was accepted to um, compete in the competition. And I was really excited. I actually had never really done a competition um, you know, that was a more formal competition in high school. I had done, you know, kind of scholarship competitions and things like this. But this seemed like a lot bigger. There's a, you know, figure and prize. And um, so I was very excited. And at that point, I definitely had no idea just how much that experience of being um, at the competition would mean for me down the road. So. Fast forward a couple months to February 2008 when the competition was happening. I was driving down to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is where the first round of the competition is held. And I remember the orientation lunch, particularly, um, where all of the competitors got to meet. And um, the Sphinx competition actually has two divisions. They have a junior division. Uh, which is uh, 17 and under, and also the senior division, which is uh, 17 and older. So we were all in this room, um, in a ballroom and you know, some random hotel in Ann Arbor, I don't remember the hotel. And um, we were welcomed by Andre Dowell, who's now the chief programming officer of Sphinx. And I remember his talk and him saying, you know, uh, oh, we're all part of this family now. You're all part of La Familia Sphinx now. Okay. This isn't a normal competition welcome, by the way. <laughs> Usually, uh, string competitions involve a lot of nerves, and most people don't really want to intermingle with each other too much. There's kind of this, uh, maybe a slight bit of animosity between competitors, but this was totally different. And uh, um, Andre really emphasized that about how, um, you know, we're a part of this family, we're here to compete, sure, but more than anything, we're really here to support each other and to learn from one another and, you know, to kind of foster community and advocacy for people like us in the classical music field. So I definitely knew right off the bat that this was something that was going to be really unique and, uh, and life-changing. And I wanted to share a, a particular moment during the competition that actually really helped me kind of change my, my vision of what the future of classical music would look like and can look like. Um, this was at the junior division final round. So they had dwindled down the competitors to three people. And uh, they were to um, play with the backdrop of the Sphinx Symphony Orchestra which is, as far as my knowledge, the only orchestra made up entirely of Latinx and uh, people of color. And just walking into Rackham Auditorium at the University of Michigan and seeing an orchestra like that is, uh, has kind of a surprising effect on you. I've had um, friends who've seen the Sphinx of New Orchestra say it's almost a culture shock to walk up and to see you know, and hear great orchestra that is all black and brown people. And I think it's so interesting because it kind of changes the way that our mind perceives what an orchestra looks like just by seeing that, you know. Um, but that's actually not the thing that really moved me about that particular concert. Um, what did was the audience. And the audience, by the way, was pretty much packed. It was a packed house. And the majority of the audience members were young students from black and brown um, elementary and middle schools um, who were pretty much there on a, like a field trip from their respective schools. Um, so there was, there was already this kind of hype there, I think probably just from kids not being in school and having that opportunity to be on a field trip. But I really remember um, you know, when the first contestant walked out, there was a warm welcome. And, um, I believe the contestant was only like 14 or 15, and they were playing Mozart Violin Concerto. And um, they started to play, and I was really blown, a lot, uh, blown away by the level and the musicianship of somebody so young that they were you know, already playing at such a high level at the age of 14. And I'm looking around and you know, seeing 
all these kids just wide-eyed, you know, looking at you know somebody that, that looks like them, somebody that they can relate to, achieving you know this amazing music with the violin. And I just thought that was so so cool, you know. Um, the, at the end of the performance, they all like went nuts. You would think that they were clapping for Beyonce or something like that. It was like it was like a total explosion of just like love and just enthusiasm. And I don't think up until that point I'd ever even seen a classical performance that like exploded like that, you know. So. And to have it be all young people and all young people of color was like, to me, incredibly moving. And before that point, um, I did maybe entertain a little bit this this idea that people around me are saying, you know, classical music is, you know, is doomed. Our audiences aren't, um, you know, we can't get young people to have interest in this music, and you know, our audiences are, are getting older. You know, what are we going to do? Um, and that day, that concert, I really got to see firsthand the power that this music has to touch all people, regardless of age, regardless of the color of their skin or where they have come from. Um, and, you know, from there I kind of started to think, well, maybe it's just the way we present this. Um, or maybe it's the culture surrounding classical music that um, makes people feel excluded. Or maybe it's because certain people don't see themselves on stage, so they feel like maybe it's not for them. Or maybe there's not access. Um, I know, for me, witnessing that, um, was very pivotal in my whole ideas of what we can do moving forward with classical music with this great art. Um, and I kind of wondered how that experience was for each of those kids in the audience to see somebody like them doing something and excelling so much in, in classical music. And I know I, I certainly felt um, transformed by that power um, of diversity in, that, in those moments. So the next year, um, I want to just fast forward, I uh, submitted another tape because I didn't uh, advance or win the competition, no big deal. <laughs> but I, um, I submitted another tape, I wasn't accepted. Um, it's actually a pretty competitive, um, it's extremely competitive honestly, they only choose like two cello players nationwide to go um, compete. Um, so I was a little bit bummed when I didn't get uh, accepted the next year, but um, Sphinx actually did reach out to me and invite me to participate in the Sphinx Symphony Orchestra, uh, which is the orchestra that accompanies the final rounds for both junior and um, senior division. Um, so being part of the Sphinx Symphony Orchestra was definitely um, a really amazing experience for me. Um, I've always loved playing in orchestra, and I love this music very much, but there is a kind of a different feel in this orchestra, and I think there's a certain acceptance and joy about being all there together on that stage, because most of the people in that orchestra are the only one like them in their respective orchestras, and people are coming from all over. Um, the country to play in this orchestra. Um, so there's this kind of, you know, this community feel that you know, we, we all can relate to this music, we can all relate to the experience of being the only one on stage that is Latinx or, you know, a person of color. Um, so that was definitely a, a really, you know, incredible feeling. And not only that, not only was the atmosphere, you know, so welcoming and loving, there, the level of musicianship was really high. It's incredible. It really is a great orchestra that comes together and, um, and plays with these competitors. And I've, I've always been really humbled to be a part of that organization and to be a part of that specific faction of, of Sphinx. Um, in the last 10 years that I've been a part of La Familia, um, Sphinx organization has expanded and continues to further its reach. Today, there are many programs that are available to Latinx and African American people of all ages, 
um, starting with the Overture program, which is a program um, that is designed to um, put instruments in the hands of beginners, of kids who are in inner city school systems that don't have access. This program is really amazing because it, it gives mentorship and lessons and um, instruments to all these kids. Um, and Sphinx kind of touches almost every part of the pipeline, starting from the very beginning all the way to people who are already in their careers professionally and seeking to advance. So um, I think it's very um, important that they not only you know focus on people who are already studying music and kind of already have a head start, but they're really focusing on the access from a young age. Um, so. You know, in a way, they're, they're, they're really trying to overcome barriers at all points of the pipeline, which is very important. Um, I have been very fortunate to be a, a recipient of many of the opportunities thanks to Sphinx. They um, have offered scholarship to all alumni of the competition, and without their support, I would not have been able to get my master's degree at the Cleveland Institute of Music because they completely gave me a full scholarship so that I could continue my study there, which was incredibly <laughs> helpful. Um, so the organization also helps to pay for many summer festivals. And there are many um, black and brown people who um, are studying music and don't have the financial resources of their white peers to go to these festivals to um, get world-class training and everything. So Sphinx really helps in, in you know, get them to those places where they are good enough to be, but maybe have the trouble um, getting the resources. So that's um, that's definitely a, a, a huge part of, of what they do. Um, another fashion that I really has had a profound effect on my musical career is um, Sphinx Virtuosi, which uh, I think Paula mentioned it's a, it's a chamber orchestra. And um, really the mission of Sphinx Virtuosi is to share the Sphinx story, to spread the word, and um, you know, to help break down barriers surrounding classical music performance. Um, the SV, as we call it, first began in 2008, I believe, and they just kind of started as a one-off concert in Carnegie Hall to showcase the talents of the past winners of the competition. Um, that was a huge success, and since then, Shahor has just gotten bigger and bigger, and it just keeps expanding. Um, now, the tour uh, happens each fall, and it's about 30 days, so it's a long tour. I recently just got off a um, tour about a couple weeks ago, so um, that was a really incredible experience. But. Um, one of the things that I love so much about this is the fact that outreach is a major component of SV. Um, many, we visit many schools and communities um, that don't have access to music like this. They don't have exposure to classical music. And we hope that our simply just showing up and being visible inspires the belief that this music doesn't belong to just one people, it belongs to all people. Um, and, you know, we've had the chance to play at sold out um, shows in Carnegie and Kennedy Center and some of the nation's, you know, top venues. But for me, actually the lunchroom performances that we do for kids who've never seen violin is really what SV is all about. Um, so there's been a lot of memories that have stuck with me over the years and I just want to share a couple from um, Sphinx Virtuosi. Um, to show how the group has made a difference in the communities that we visited. Um, the first memory is from our tour last year, 2017. We were in um, Chicago, Illinois, performing at um, a kind of small, kind of rundown theater in Bronzeville, which is a historic black neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Um, there's a lot of buzz about this um, this performance because nobody in that community had ever seen or heard a group like this, of this caliber, come through. Um, I remember we had a chance to um, speak with members of the community after the concert. And I 
was really overwhelmed by the gratitude um, that was expressed by, uh, by many members of the community, and particularly actually older members of the community. Um, the thing that really struck me um, was how they told me how much our visibility meant to them. Because they had never seen an orchestra of all black and brown people, and like I said, rarely did classical music groups even go to that community. They would usually go to, you know, the, the cultural center of, you know, downtown. Um, and until that night, they, they told me that they had never imagined that their kids could do this, that their kids could learn classical music and excel at it and even make a career out of it. Because they had never seen that. They just It wasn't even a dream that they could dream for themselves or for their kids. Um, so, you know, I just really remember that because, you know, they had never seen that representation. And for them, they were just like, wow, this opens up so many doors of what is possible for our kids, for our community. So I just started simply showing up has a has a really interesting impact on people. Just to see a group like this, I think is is really um, it can be definitely life changing in a way. Um, this year on tour, I kind of had an interesting conversation with uh, an audience member at the New World Center, which uh, we always begin our tour at Miami um, at the New World Center, and we were kind of mingling post concert reception and. Um, one of the audience members and her husband approached myself and another musician. And she was so excited to talk to us about how much she loved our performance. And, you know, she's telling us the story about how her and her husband hadn't um, you know, planned on coming to a concert. They had just, you know, kind of stumbled on it by chance. And she said, you know, yeah, I, was, I saw this, you know, you saw the, your photo and, um, you know, we went in and you guys walked on stage and I had no idea you guys would be so good. You know, and, and I kind of, me and my uh, my fellow musician kind of kind of cringed for a moment, but we knew that she didn't mean any harm, um, and that she was just being honest, because I mean, honestly, you don't see that very often. You don't see world class performances where there's many black and brown people out there playing classical music, and. In fact, um, there was a survey done by the League of American Orchestras that revealed out of all of the um, orchestral musicians in all orchestras, robo orchestras, and also you know, um, bigger budgeted orchestras, only 2.5% of those musicians are Latinx. And only 1.8% of those musicians are um, African American which is kind of crazy to think about. There's a lot of orchestras and it's such a small number. Um, but I just, I think it's so interesting hearing this woman's um, response and also, you know, seeing how it's actually not very different from the response of the people in the community in Bronzeville. Um, for them, um, our visibility and our excellence really transformed her perception or their perception of what great classical music can look like. Um, the music that Sphinx Virtuosi performs is also uh, really important to mention because um, our artistic director and one of the Sphinx founders, Alpha Dworkin, is very adamant about um, programming works by composers um, who are underrepresented in classical music. In past tours, uh, there has always been significant works or um, commissioned works by composers who are kind of relegated to the margins. And not only do we perform these works, but we speak about why it's important to perform music written by women, by people of color, <coughs> by Latinx people, and also by members of the LGBTQ community who all too often have their gender non-conforming identities kind of hidden or erased from history. So Sphinx really works with um, a number of composers um, who are parts of these various communities by commissioning new works and also by performing them, um, performing works little known to the public. Uh, there's often a theme to the program and this year's theme was Music Without Borders, um, which kind of inspired my talk for today actually. Uh, this concert really was designed to illuminate 
works by composers from communities that were searching for harmony in times of conflict and hardship. Um, we performed works by composers from Japan, Syria, Uruguay, and also the U.S. African American composer and jazz trumpeter Terence Blanchard. We also performed a work by this guy named Dmitry Shostakovich. I don't know if you've heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> With the exception of um, Shostakovich, many of us in this group had never actually heard the music or even the names of a lot of these composers. And it's a shame because all of the music, as we found out, is really amazing and, um, and very moving. And for us, we felt that this concert and this idea of music without borders is incredibly important um, right now and incredibly relevant right now um, in history and in our current you know, political and social climate. Um, the message that this concert kind of sends out to audience members, and many audience members kind of commented on this, was that, you know, despite all of our differences in our various cultural practices or spiritual beliefs, we all have this common desire to find harmony and to find happiness. It's not very often in my day-to-day -day life being a classical musician that I get to perform works that make me feel that way, that make me feel like I'm really making a difference in people's um, in people's lives, about what, how they think. Um, so I, I think that this particular tour that just happened this year, I will always remember because just the, the response from, from people about how important it is to show this different music um, is incredibly important. And I think Sphinx is really doing um, so many things to make classical music more inclusive and more relevant. One of the latest initiatives that I'm working with Sphinx on and very excited about is the uh, National Alliance for Audition Support, or NAS. And NAS is a partnership between the Sphinx organization, the League of American Orchestras, uh, the New World Symphony, and also a group of artists council uh, who are Latinx and black musicians in the classical music field. Um, this is a initiative is funded by the Andrew Mellon Foundation, and the aim of the project is to help musicians of color train for and win orchestral auditions. I was invited to be a, a member of the Artist Council back in January and have since been working uh, with other fellow musicians of color to identify barriers that exist in the orchestral world and to provide solutions that will hopefully move the needle, creating um, orchestras that are more diverse and inclusive. Um, this far, most of the funds for the project are going towards financial assistance to musicians. Um, <clears throat> taking auditions is not only a very rigorous process, it's actually a very expensive process. Um, getting to these various cities to take auditions costs money, staying in hotels, all those things, and it really adds up. Um, so a major barrier that many, of, um, many people of color face are financial barriers and you can't win an audition that you can't afford to travel to. <clears throat> so NAS really addresses this issue by providing scholarship um, and funds for lessons and also flights and various other costs incurred um, while taking <coughs> auditions. There's even a program that's been developed to um, get fine, uh, fine instruments into the hands of those who don't have a fine instrument to compete on because many of their peers that will that be competing against probably do have very quality instruments, so I think that's a really important aspect of this um, process. Um, when I first joined this um, initiative, I was really excited about everything um, that they were doing, but um, I kind of had it in the back of my mind that um, it wasn't enough to just help the musicians of color, because um, even if we're able to get them the best uh, mentorship and find instrument and the funding and everything to get to the audition, um, there's still the very real possibility that they are up against institutional racism that exists. Um, so, you know, I was speaking with some other colleagues of mine um, who uh, had a lot to say more than I did about um, experiencing um, institutional racism within certain orchestras, 
And so we decided that it's really important that we convince or influence orchestras um, nationwide to really take a very honest assessment of what the orchestras are doing to make sure the organizations are inclusive and welcoming of people of color, um, both on stage and in the, in the community. Um, this aspect of NASA is still kind of in development, but now we've begin, uh, began to partner with various orchestras. And these partner orchestras are institutions that want to be part of the change for a more inclusive orchestral world. And um, they've also uh, contributed financially to NAS and are aligned with the goals of NAS. Now there are more than 40 partner orchestras um, signed on to this initiative, and I'm very proud to say that our own Akron Symphony is among them. Um, my hope is that through NAS, we can not only help musicians of color to overcome these barriers to face in their day-to-day -day lives, but more importantly, that this influence on orchestras to embrace um, equity and inclusion is really, um, you know, taken care of. Um, there are a number of ways we've talked about um, trying to make um, these institutions, our orchestra institutions, more inclusive and um, had conversations about hiring process, how to make amends, um, like keeping the screen up all the way through by programming works with people of color and by women and by inviting guest artists uh, and soloists and conductors who are women and people of color. There's many things that, that can be done, even down to how you market you know, an orchestra to really get, get the message out there to a broader community. Um, it really pleases me to see how many of the orchestras want to become involved in us when it's not even a year old. And it gives me a lot of hope that we can move this needle, that we can um, make our orchestras um, nationwide be more diverse. Uh, I referred earlier to um, the survey conducted by the League of American Orchestras that only 2.5% of the entire makeup of orchestras orchestral musicians are Latinx and 1.8 are African American. Um, I want to just for a second kind of travel back in time a little bit and um, paint a picture of the American Orchestra um, before we had screened auditions. Um, I use YouTube a lot to reference recordings and things when I'm preparing for a concert. And um, there's a lot of videos out there of um, the New York Philharmonic with Leonard Bernstein. And um, you should pull up some of these videos. They're actually they're incredible. The music making is amazing. But the thing that always kind of makes me laugh and strikes me is you look at these videos and it's all men. It's all white men. I mean, you have to really strain your eyes to find one woman in that, in that orchestra. And, um, you know, I don't think it was that women weren't talented enough to be in the orchestra. I think that it was evident that, you know, inherent sexism in our society was influencing that. And in the 70s and 80s, orchestras began to hold screened auditions for the first time. Suddenly women were in the orchestra. Suddenly women were winning these jobs and keeping them. And if you look at those orchestras 40 or 50 years ago versus today, you see a totally different picture. And I think it's really astounding how much progress has been made. Um, granted, sexism isn't, hasn't been eradicated from the classical music world. Um, women are still vastly underrepresented as composers and as conductors. But you can see that there has been progress. Um, there was a distinctive turn that occurred, and it really began within the orchestra institutions themselves. There was this desire to make hiring practices um, more fair, and they took measures to create a process that would eliminate gender bias. I believe that our orchestras can continue to make this change and make changes within their organizations um, to foster inclusion, <coughs> diversity, and to help make the classical music and art form that can and does enrich the lives of all people in all communities. I just want to conclude with a little short story about um, 
uh, Shinichi Suzuki, who was the uh, founder of the Suzuki Method. Um, young Sunichi had traveled in the 1920s abroad to further his musical careers. And he ended up in Germany studying with the uh, famous violinist Karl Klingler. Through Klingler, Suzuki was given the opportunity to perform at a dinner party of intellectuals and well-respected citizens of Berlin. Um, Albert Einstein happened to be among the group. They were later to become friends, Suzuki and Einstein. And the piece that uh, Suzuki performed was a concerto by Max Bruch, who's a German composer. And um, apparently he was very well received, he did a great performance, and there was a woman in the audience who apparently um, turned to Einstein and said she was really amazed because despite his Japanese heritage, he was able to capture the Germanness of the music whatever the Germanness of the music means, I don't know, but that's, that's what she said. And um, apparently Einstein turned to her and replied, Madame, people are all the same. People are all people. So I just want to leave that little story with you guys because I think it's really a kind of a neat story um, to share. But um, that's my talk.